Let's say you moved into a new neighborhood and you met your neighbors on either side and they both seem really pleasant, but you quickly start to realize that they don't seem to trust each other. In fact, for the most part, they just avoid each other altogether. If you wanted to mend their relationship so that you could have true community in your neighborhood, you would have to figure out what happened between these two neighbors before you got there. Well, in Evansville, there's a similar division and lack of trust between black and white residents. And if we want to help mend those relationships so that we can have true community in our city, we have to ask the question, what happened here? In order to help us answer that question, I'm going to be spending some time with Kelly Coors today. We're going to look at two key events in Evansville's history related to that division and mistrust. Kelly, how's it going? Excellent. How are you? Thanks for taking the time to be here today. Uh, right now, we're in between the old courthouse, which I think a lot of people are familiar mm -hmm. with downtown. A landmark. And the old jail, which people will recognize as that building that kind of looks like a castle. Right downtown. So um, help us understand, we're, we're talking about an event here that happened about 120 years ago. Help us understand like what was Evansville like at that time and then what's what's the event that actually took place right here on 4th Street? Well Evansville was completely segregated. Uh, black and white were separate, separate schools. Uh, very few blacks worked with whites in, in businesses here. It was it was completely segregated. There was a lot of racial tension that uh, had built up over the years, but it all came to a head on the 4th of July, 1903. There was an incident where uh, a black gentleman uh, shot, uh, got in a gunfight with a pl white police officer, and both of them were wounded, but the white police officer died. And uh, the, the black gentleman was arrested and was being held in the jail. Uh, but over the hours the, after the policeman had died, the announcement was made, uh, a, a, a huge mob formed here in 4th Street. The newspapers said three to 4,000 people were, wow. were surrounding the, the uh, old jail. And, and this, they was, were, this was that evening? Well, it was, the it was the next day, it was July 5th. The, okay. the, the policeman died July the 5th. So once the announcement was made that the policeman had died, uh, a huge uh, mob formed here on 4th Street all around the, the old jail. They were, they were going to lynch this man because they were distrustful of the court system that he would not be punished. Sure. So they, uh, the mayor and the sheriff decided to get this gentleman uh, out of town. They took him, there's a tunnel that runs under 4th Street right here and the mayor and the sheriff escorted this gentleman through the tunnel and took him out the back of the courthouse and took him to Vincennes where he died about 30 days later from gangrene from his uh, gunshot wounds. So there were thousands of people here right. trying to trying to get him out of the jail to lynch him. And to they actually him. snuck him under the street and out the other side of the Correct. courthouse. Correct. And uh, the, the, cra the mob didn't believe that he was gone. The, the sheriff came out and told the crowd, you know, we've, we've sent him out of town. So the mob pulled down a telephone pole and uh, battered in the door of the jail and invaded the jail to try and find him. Uh, and then once they found that he was gone, then part of the mob went to the black neighborhood and started to break windows and set fires and assault people in the street. So help me understand, like, what was going through the minds of the people who were participating in this mob, who were, who were part of this event? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? And what was kind of the, the mood that was that was happening here on the street that day. Well, lynch mobs uh, lynch mobs were formed because people had a distrust of the legal system. They had a distrust of the court system and felt that that uh, black criminals could not not face punishment for 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 their crimes. So they decided to take law into their own hands. Early lynchings were more revenge. They were they were done in private. They were done out in the wilderness, out in the woods. But by the 1880s and 1890s, lynchings had turned into spectacles where there would be thousands of people watching and participating in the, the murder of a black person. So they were um, there because they wanted to see it happen. They wanted to see the thing done. They wanted to see it happen. They wanted to see this person pay for their crime. Uh, and they wanted, in, their, in that way, they could participate. But lynching photography became uh, a, a thing in the late 19th century when, when photography became more commonplace and cameras and film 
uh, became more accessible. So there's a whole school of lynching photography uh, in our collective history where you know people people actually were photographing the the lynchings were advertised and became events uh, and would attract five ten thousand people to wow. come and, and watch people could sell could sell ice cream and lemonade and and uh, would people bring like their families they bring their families to these these wow. things and so that's what that evening almost turned into was a, a spectacle type lynching All right, so we're fast forwarding four years, four years from the riot that we just talked about. And we're looking at another event that happened uh, here in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We're on Linwood Avenue. A scandal. And at the time, this was a uh, all white neighborhood, not right. just predominantly white, all, all white. white. Um, can you tell us uh, what, what happened here? Sure. This was Tuxedo Park in June of 1907. Uh, the gentleman that owned this house Henry Schrader also owned a house next door. He'd lived in 915 while he was building 913. Um, and the neighbors picked up their Saturday newspapers in June of 1907 and read that Henry Schrader had sold 915 to Moses and Beulah Davis, who were well known as African-American educators at the segregated Frederick Douglass High School. Okay, so this is where the house actually used to stand. 915. And this was just four years after the riots that we talked about. Right. It seems to me that that's a pretty bold move for this couple to, in that climate, in that environment, to look to buy a house in an all-white neighborhood. I would imagine that they were expecting a lot of pushback for that. Um, but eventually that pushback did lead them to cancel the sale of the house. Can you help me understand, like, like what was it that, that made them eventually succumb to that pressure and buy a house somewhere else? Well, I, the, neighbors, uh, the neighbors started trying to uh, get Henry Schrader, the seller, to cancel the sale, and he, and he said he couldn't because he'd signed a contract with them. So the neighbors went to the school board, the president of the school board, so he said, no, we're not going to fire them. So the neighbors turned to different kinds of pressure. They threatened to poison the cistern for the drinking water of the, of the, of the home. Uh, they threatened to uh, rename all of the dogs Beulah after Mrs. Davis. They went to the grocer, the grocers and the, uh, the ice delivery people who were not going to deliver to, these, to the family. Um, Eventually, they threatened to burn the house down. They said if the Davises moved in, that they would burn the house to the ground rather than have these people live here. But I think what, what happened that tipped the scale for them, the, the Evansville uh, the Journal, the Daily Journal, the editor of the journal wrote that, in his opinion, the Davises caused this crisis to happen um, by inserting themselves into an all-white neighborhood before Evansville was ready and that they should seek to buy a house among their own people. They came here to educate black children and that they would be much better off living amongst uh, black neighbors rather than to force social equality before white people are ready for it. Because it was right after that that they canceled the sale with Henry Schrader and, and bought a different house on Chestnut Street. Okay, so I want to kind of get into why we should care about this particular event that happened. Because again, um, the people who tried to buy this house, they're not around anymore. Mm -hmm. The people who lived in this neighborhood, they're not around anymore. Um, how, how does this story and what it represents still impact Evansville today and wh why should we care about it? Well, 56 years later in 1963, a black teacher and his wife tried to buy a house at 546 South Kelsey. The house had been owned by someone who'd passed away and the heirs uh, were trying to sell it through the trust department at Citizens Bank. And the realtor called the bank when Mr. and Mrs. Chester showed up to buy the house. They had cash, enough to wow. buy the house outright. And the realtor called the bank and said, what do we do? And the trust department at the bank called the heirs mm -hmm. and said, what do we do? And the heirs said, take it off the market. And so we care about that because that was during my lifetime. Right. I was nine years old in 1968. And the, you know, Evansville is still heavily segregated. But it's important to remember people like the Davises who were oppressed. That was oppression. The Chesters were oppressed. 
And so wherever you find oppression, you find a denial of rights. Yeah. And what is it, the old saying, if, if one person's rights are denied, all of our rights are denied. Yeah, I think even though over the course of that time, a lot of the laws and policies had changed, people's minds hadn't changed, they had minds. that they hadn't, they hadn't learned to trust one another, they hadn't opened up their minds to not being divided. And I think, um, you know, whenever I think about those stories and what we see today, uh, our city is still geographically very segregated because those things were in place. Um, but also it seems like we're still dealing with some of the, the mindsets of like, how do we learn to trust one another? How do we learn to live in community with each other? And looking at these stories, reflecting on them, reckoning them with them, like you said, kind of gives us the opportunity to address where those mindsets still linger in our community and even in our own lives. How can we open ourselves up to, um, to living together in this community? Well, I hope you learned as much as I did from our time together with Kelly. It's important that we look back at the history because it gives us a better chance of moving forward together. If we can understand the roots of the mistrust and division that exist in our community, then we can address those things. We can mend those relationships and create community for Evansville.